Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith. Having your Bibles this morning, let's open them, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And welcome to part 4 in our series entitled The Holy Scriptures. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. Today we will be concluding this series, I believe. 2 Timothy 3. And I have a strong uh, anointing upon me today to really teach, not to be preachy today, but to teach. I'm going to ask you to take notes today. Most of us are already in that mode, but I'm really going to go slow over some things. We're going to look at something today that some of you have probably never heard of. So this is going to open up a door for you to think about some things you've never thought of before. This is going to... Uh, cause some of you, you that have heard some of this on an outlying, maybe peripheral, you've heard one or two statements, of, but never really heard a message on it. This is going to open up that door wider for you. And so this is going to be something that I, I, I've never heard this taught uh, in all the churches I've been to and all the sermons I've heard. I've never heard this taught as a subject, and uh, I think you're going to be really blessed today by this. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17 is the passage that we're using for this series called the Holy Scriptures. So uh, let me, let me, well, let's, let's read this. 2 Timothy 3, 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learn them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works." Almost 10 years ago, I was driving on Highway 24, going from Lyman to Colorado Springs, moving to, to Colorado for the first time, and I had an experience with God in my car. I'm going to cut it short because all we've got to look at, but I need to say this for the new people that are here. God, the presence of God filled up my car, I began to weep, and the Lord spoke to me so strong, and He said, Son, there's coming a fresh attack upon my word. Will you help me? And I was just so overcome by the the, the presence of the Lord and so overcome by the strength of his voice that I, I had to pull over and I just had my, my head, my arms draping over the string wheel and just weeping in the presence of the Lord. And I said, yes, I'll, I'll do whatever. And then, so I moved here, met Leanne, we fell in love, got married, got situated. And so God kind of picked up from where he left off. And he said to me that there's going to come a threefold attack upon his word. And when he said that, I, in my mind's eye, I had a picture of a, of a pitchfork, of a three-pronged uh, fork that someone would use like to bale hay or something like that, a pitchfork. And so he said, a threefold attack upon my word. And, and it's like, okay, well, Lord, what is it? And he said, the first is addition, the second is subtraction, and the third is substitution. That people are going to add to what he had to say, subtract from what he said, and switch it and substitute it. And so uh, that was helpful for, for me. And so this series has kind of been born out of years of study and getting ready to teach on some of these things. And so I'm endeavoring to I'll be obedient to the Lord as he leads in this area. And so we've looked at these verses here, and I'm not going to repeat all that we have said in the past. But I do want us to look at verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, now look at verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
the Holy Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. Now, when you read that, do not think that that only means, yeah, I got born again. I heard the Word of God and I got born again. It means the new birth, but it means much more than that. When the Bible talks about the Scriptures are, are able to make... Are, uh, I'm getting excited, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The Bible, the scriptures have the ability to make you wise in any area that you need to be saved from. If you're struggling financially, the Bible will give you the wisdom on how to deal with the finances and change the situation. If you're dealing with sickness in your body, you have a sickness or a disease, the scriptures are the answer. They'll make you wise unto healing. Right? Amen. If, you're, if your marriage is on the rocks, you've got trouble with your kids, the scriptures will make you wise in the area of relationships and will save you. The scriptures are, will make you wise unto anything and everything that you need to be saved from. Amen? Amen. The, the answers are right here in this book. The Holy Scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to notice, I know we've already read this, but I want to go slow here. I want you to, to see the progression of the wording of verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, we've already looked at that. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction... For instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The scriptures will bring you to a place of perfection. I'm going to ask you to write that down. The scriptures will bring you to a place of perfection. The scriptures will bring you to the place of perfection and thoroughly equip you for all that God has for you. The scriptures will bring you to the place of perfection and thoroughly equip you for all that God has for you. How many of you would agree with me that God has a plan for every born-again Christian? Every child of God, God has a plan. God, you know, look, think about your own body. You want no unused parts. <laughs> every part of your body is important to you. Every part of your body you want to work perfectly. Well, the Bible says we are the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. And when he looks at his body, he wants no unused parts. He has a plan and a purpose, a design, a call, an anointing for every person in the body of Christ. Thank you for that. Amen. So how do we discover that? Well, we go to the scriptures because the scriptures will equip you. They will equip you for what you're called to do. Now your calling may be different than mine, but we're still called. We're still in the body. We're still to be used of the Lord. So there's no need in comparing ourselves what we want to do is just be a blessing to each other and encourage one another and whatever that function is in, in the body of Christ. I'll take another amen right there. Amen. The scriptures will bring you to the place of perfection and thoroughly equip you for all that God has for you. If you are perfect, if you are thoroughly equipped, how, how confident will you be in your calling? How confident would you be in your place where you're functioning in the body of Christ, how confident would you be knowing I have been equipped by God? God has used the word to equip me. I'm strong, I'm able, I'm ready to go. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. Now, in this, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This speaks of duty. Now, don't make that word a bad word. The word duty just means our responsibility, right? We all have a duty to perform. We have a function to operate in in the body of Christ. So this speaks of our duty. But if you notice the wording of this passage from verse 16 and into 17, 
He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is before duty. Amen. Doctrine is before duty. You need to know doctrine before you function, before you do your duty. Now, the word doctrine in our circles has a bad connotation to it. But there's, the differ there's a difference between the doctrine of God and the doctrines and traditions of man that make the word of God of no effect. All right? We don't want anything to do with the traditions and the doctrines of man. We want everything to do and hold close to the doctrines of God. Amen. You see that? So doctrine comes before duty. So all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine first. And after the doctrine and as a part of that, the scriptures will equip you to do what God's called you to do. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So what I want us to do today is I want us to take a journey together. And I want us to look at a very important doctrine. Okay. We're going to look at a doctrine of God today. A lot going on on the inside of this boy right now. Woo. <clears throat> so in this series, we have emphasized all Scripture is given by inspiration. And we've talked about how inspiration means in spirit. It does not mean God breathed. Right? You all remember that. Those of you that haven't been here, go online or get the CDs. So in keeping with all Scripture is given by inspiration... I want us to kind of pick up on that theme and go into a doctrine of God. Many today believe that the words of the Bible are uninspired. Many today believe that the words of the Bible are uninspired, or we could say not inspired. The devil is so subtle in his attack against the Word of God. So subtle. And I'm thankful that the Lord is peeling away the layers and helping me to understand and see some things that his attack uh, uh, on the scriptures sometimes is blatant and right out there. Other times it's so subtle. And we've talked about how uh, blatantly the devil has attacked the word of God in our society by adding to, uh, this is real simple, that Jesus went around preaching uh, love and acceptance. And Jesus did not go around preaching love and acceptance. He went around preaching love and repentance. Amen. Right? Amen. He never said, he never talked about all inclusion. You're okay. I'm okay. Everything's okay. He never, he never preached that. He preached love and repentance. He loves us where we're at, but he loves us too much to keep us where we're at. Amen. So he's going to bring reproof. He's going to bring correction because he wants us to be conformed to his image. Right? All right. Hallelujah. Many today believe that the words of the Bible are uninspired, that it was the thoughts behind the words that were inspired. This is an attack of the enemy upon the, on, upon the Word of God. Many say, yeah, the, the Bible is inspired, but it's not the words. It's, it was the thought behind the words. It was the intent of the writer. It's a subtle attack. So, hmm. the words are not inspired, it was the thoughts. If that's true, then we must keep recasting the Bible writer's words to try and find the inspired thoughts. Amen. Do you see that? I'm going to go over this, I want to read this word for word. Many today believe that the words of the Bible are uninspired. It was the thoughts behind the words that were inspired. Therefore, we must keep recasting the Bible writer's words to try and find the inspired thoughts. If this is the case, we are all lost at sea. We are in hopeless confusion because each generation must then settle for itself what the Holy Spirit meant to say through the blundering Bible writers. The end result, no generation can really arrive at the truth. 
because we got to just keep recasting. You know, it, it's not the words, it's the thought behind it. So we're going to keep changing the words and, and try with this translation and this translation and this translation to try to find what God really meant to say. And so we're, we're lost at sea. I've got good news for you today. I've got good news. The good news is that the Holy Spirit is not only the author of the thoughts, but He's the author of the very words to express those thoughts. The Holy Spirit is not just the author of the thoughts, He's the author of the words behind the thoughts. It's easy to do a switcheroo and bring the attack of substitution if, if the words aren't inspired, it's just the thoughts. What did he really mean? Now, I'm, I'm, we've got men and women in here, but there's quite a few women in here. I can tell you as a married man that words are important to a woman. Amen. And I have been in trouble more than once by choosing the wrong words. <laughs> yeah. So don't tell me that words aren't important. Because if I tell you words aren't important, I better duck because there's some women in here that may throw something at me. Words are very important to a woman, right? Yeah. You know why? Because they're created in the image of God, and women are sensitive to words like the Holy Ghost is sensitive to words. A man will say something, and his wife will start crying. He'll go, what? What, what did I say? And to him it was like a feather, but to her it was like a, a ton of bricks. He chose the wrong words. And he goes, well, I, what I meant to say, <laughs> just go out to the doghouse. It's just too late, man. It's just too late. Right? I painted my shed and cleaned it up for a reason, all right? <laughs> if I get the lawnmower out, I can get a little bed in there. <clears throat> and this... Sermon's going totally different than what I planned. <laughs> All right. The good news is the Holy Ghost is the author not only of the thoughts but of the words. If the words are imperfect, the thoughts expressed by those words is also imperfect. And every married woman said amen to that. If the words are imperfect, the thoughts expressed by those words is also imperfect. But this cannot be for the Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. I'm going to ask you to write that down. The Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. And now all that was introduction. And I want us to get into the doctrine of the testimony of God. The Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. And the title of our message today is The Testimony of God. Would you please say the Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God? The Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. Okay. We're going to be reading some scriptures today that we don't read very often, I would think. And so we're going to look at these, read them several times, and pull out some wonderful truths in them. Let's read, please, in the book of Exodus, chapter 31. I'll give you time to turn there and finish writing your notes up there. The Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. Not only are the thoughts inspired and the authored by the Holy Ghost, the words themselves are authored by the Holy Ghost. The words are inspired. Exodus 31 and verse 18. Exodus 31, 18. The Holy Scriptures are the testimony of God. Are you there? Okay. <clears throat> and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion, communing with him upon Mount Sinai, Two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now this is during the time that Moses is up in the mountain with God. He's up there for 40 days. And this is like the 38th, 39th day that he was up there. And God wrote and gave to Moses 
what we call the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says that they're called two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. The two tables of the testimony. The writing was the hand of God. Two tables of the testimony. The writing was the hand of God. Now, if you want to talk about God favoring a man, here is God favoring with Moses with something that is far more precious in comparison to the priestly garment of Aaron that had the, had the 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Those stones were, were beautiful. They were precious. They were costly stones. And yet God handed Moses two ordinary stone tablets. But what made them so priceless was the, the words on there written by the hand of God himself. And they were the tables of testimony. What an honor. What a favor God gave this man and what honor he bestowed on him. I believe it is of importance. And one of the things that we teach around here is what we call the, the um, law first reference. When something is mentioned for the first time in the scriptures, it holds weight, it holds precedent. And when you look at that throughout the rest of scripture, a lot of that is founded upon its first occurrence. I believe that is, it is of importance that the first occurrence of the word written in Scripture is attributed to God. And that is Exodus 24, 12. The very first time the word written is found in the Bible, it is attributed to God, and it's Exodus 24, 12. I believe that it's also important that the first occurrence of the word writing in Scripture is attributed to God, and that's Exodus 32.16. Exodus 32.16 is the first place in the Bible that we read the word writing. The word written and the word writing is God doing it. I think that's very significant. Amen. These two tablets, am I going too fast? I don't want to go too fast. I want everybody to stay with me. These two Tablets of stone were known as the tables of testimony. These two tables were written with the finger of God. I believe that there's so much importance into that. One of them is that God only can write his law in the heart by his spirit. God only can write his law in the heart by his spirit. God only can write his law in the heart by his spirit. The Bible says that the, the tables of stone were written by the finger of God. And the Bible tells us that the spirit of God is the finger of God. So the spirit of God wrote those words on those tablets of stone. And the Holy Ghost today writes his words upon the tablet of our heart. There's a lot in there. It's rich. Exodus 25, please. Exodus 25. We're going backwards. But this is the way the Lord had me to do this. So Exodus 25. Verse 21 and 22. There's just so much in my spirit about this last point that we just did, about God writing upon that, those tablets by, by his own hand. That writing written was first attributed to God. God knows words. Amen. As my man of God says, there were no Uggs in the Garden of Eden. Okay? Forget the false teaching 
about the caveman and all he could do was point and go, ugh, ugh, <laughs> and grab his girl by the hair and drag her through the cave and point to the food and go, ugh, ugh. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them with language. Amen. He created them with faculty of speech. They did not, they were not created and, and all they could do was see cat run. They had full faculty. They had full ability to communicate with each other and with God. God knows words. Amen. And it's wrong for us to look at our wife and go, ugh. And it's wrong for you women to look at your husbands and go, ugh. Right? Unless you're looking at a bug and you go, ugh. <laughs> What I mean by that is we need to show each other respect. Exodus 25, 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So this is back before he went up on the mountain and received the tables. Let's do that again. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. The mercy seat is above the testimony. All right, the mercy seat is above the testimony. We are all somewhat familiar with what we call the Ark of the Covenant. It's also called the Ark of the Testament, the Ark of the Testimony, because the testimony, the, co the commandments, were going to be put in this box, and so it was called the Ark of the Testimony. Now, God says, I want you to make this box, and I want you to put a mercy seat on top of it, and there's going to be an angel on one side with his wings spread out, and the angel is going to be looking, and then on this side, the other angel is going to have his wings spread out, and he's going to be looking, and their wings are going to be touching, and the angels are going to be there over the ark of the testimony. They're going to be over the testimony. The mercy seat is over the testimony. This is extremely important. God meets with us and communes with us at his testimony. God meets with us and he communes with us at his testimony. It is dangerous to seek God apart and away from the Holy Scriptures. Amen. Do you want to seek God? Great. But how you do it is also important. Never seek God apart from the Scriptures because He hovers over. His mercy hovers over. His presence hovers over His testimony. There's a spirit world out there and there's all kinds of junky spirits. And just because you pray, you've got to know who you're praying to. Amen. Right? And to get away from this is dangerous because His mercy is above the testimony, meaning that God's presence hovers over His Word. And those angels are there, and they are looking at the testimony. What does that remind you of? Psalm 107, verse 20. Psalm 107, 20 talks about how His angels hearken to the voice of His Word. That may be a wrong reference. I think Psalm 107, 20 is he sent his word and healed them. Uh, but somewhere around in there right now is the, uh, that reference where angels hearken to the voice of his word. Not only does God's mercy hover over his testimony because he's watching it, he's preserving it, he is going to make sure that it's carried out. And he has angels that are assigned to watch this word. And when we believe it and speak it, those angels get going. Amen. Amen. It is the testimony of God. Man, that's powerful. God's presence hovers over his written word, watching it and preserving it. It's the testimony of God. 
Let's go to Exodus 16, please. Exodus 16, 32. Exodus 16, 32 through 34. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now these, these verses are also extremely important, and we have here once again the law of first reference. If you will notice... The word testimony in verse 34, this is the first time the word testimony is in the scriptures. You will also notice that the word testimony is capitalized. Amen. Oh, oh my, 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 how important is this? The first time the word testimony is in the scripture, it is capitalized. And I want you to know why that is so significant. The manna and I'm, I'm explaining this, the manna was to be kept, preserved, and protected for your generations. Right? Amen. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you for flowing through me. Thank you for giving me the words and helping me with this. The manna came down on a daily basis. They picked it up, and they had to eat it that day. If they kept it overnight, it would breed worms. But on the, on the sixth day, God gave enough for them to collect it so they could have some for the seventh day, and the seventh day was their day of rest, right? Amen. So God gave them enough for two days on the sixth day. But out of those six days, every day they had to pick up and eat for that day. The manna was to be kept in this jar, in this pot, and it was to be preserved and protected for your generations. Why did God put manna in a jar for years to come? Not only why, but how he did it was also interesting. The manna that was put in that jar was kept fresh. It never grew old. It never decayed. It never bred worms. It was a continuous miracle. Okay? Oh, this is, this is so important. The memory of this provision was preserved by the preservation of the manna. Would you please write that down? The memory of this provision was preserved by the preservation of the manna. The memory of this provision was preserved by the preservation of the manna. When God preserved the manna, he was wanting to preserve their memory. He didn't want them to forget what he had done for them. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. The preservation of this manna from waste and corruption was a standing miracle and therefore the more proper memorial of this miracle food. Simply put, God had this man put in a jar, kept for generations because he didn't want his people to forget what he had done, and he kept the manna fresh for years and years and years, for generations, so that the children of Israel would look at that and go, God provided for us. He took care of us in the wilderness. He, God did not allow the manna to grow stale, and they go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. But because it was kept fresh, they were like, whoa. By preserving the manna, he was endeavoring to preserve their memory of what had happened. Okay? Eaten bread must not be forgotten. 
eaten bread must not be forgotten. God's miracles and mercies must be in remembrance. Eaten bread must not be forgotten. God's miracles and mercies must be in remembrance. When you hear the word remembrance, what's one of the scriptures you think about? Yeah, do this in, do this in remembrance of me, right? So God didn't want them to forget his miracles. He didn't want them to forget his mercies. And so he kept that jar of manna and he kept it in perfect preservation. Manna is a type of Jesus. John 6.35. Don't turn there. Manna is a type of Jesus. John 6.35. Jesus said that he was the bread that came down from heaven. But he talked about manna. And so he's the manna. Now, Jesus was preserved. Acts 2, 26 and 27. Jesus was preserved. Acts 2, 26 and 27. Once again, don't turn there. The manna came from God and it was perfectly preserved. Jesus came from God and he was perfectly preserved. Do you remember how Jesus said that when he would die and go to hell, that God would not allow his body to undergo decay? That it was preserved? Amen. Right? So manna, it was a type of Jesus. Now, Catch this, manna is a type of the Word of God. Manna is a type of the Word of God. Revelations 19, 13 and Matthew 4, 4. Manna is a type of the Word of God. Revelations 19, 13 and Matthew 4, 4. Manna came from heaven and was preserved. Jesus came from heaven and he was preserved. The word of God came from heaven, and guess what? It's preserved. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, and 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25. The word of God is perfectly preserved for us. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 and 25. You guys are doing so good. I think you guys are caught up with me and you're right with me on this, right? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 and 25. Manna is a type of the Word of God. Revelations 19, 13 and Matthew 4, 4. And it was perfectly preserved for us. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. And 1 Peter verse, chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. Now, let's look at verses 32 through 34 one more time. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Notice the wording. Lay it up before the Lord, capital L, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony, capital T, to be kept. Lord and testimony are used as equivalent and interchangeable. The word Lord and testament are used equivalent and interchangeable. This is the reason why testimony had to be capitalized. I'm going to say it real simple in just a moment. Lord and testimony are used as equivalent and interchangeable. This equivalence is the reason testimony had to be capitalized. Now, I'm going to say it to you real simple. Jesus is God's testimony. Would you agree with that? Amen. Jesus is God's testimony. The scriptures are the testimony of God. Jesus is the testimony of God. The scriptures are the testimony of God.
Verse 34. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it, the manna, up before the testimony to be kept. What is God's testimony? We had a testimony service before I began preaching. What is a testimony? What is God's testimony? Think with me for a moment. We all know that testimony, testified, is a legal term. I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that God has taken the witness stand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me? Yes. <laughs> I do. I do. And God has taken the witness stand, and He has legally testified. And what is that testimony? You're going to like this. God's testimony is that He has provided for His people in the wilderness. God's testimony to you and I is that God has provided everything we will ever need. Hallelujah. Whether it's a spiritual need, it's a mental need, an emotional need, a physical need, a financial need, a relationship need, God has gone on record and He has given us this book, which is His testimony that He has made the provision for us. He provided for them in the wilderness. You and I are in the wilderness. How many of us, there are times we just sigh. We just long to get out of here and go home. And it may not be a bad day. There may be no test and trial. Everything may be good right then. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. But on the inside, it's like, I want to go home. We are in the wilderness. And in this wilderness, God has provided for us. He has testified to that. The Bible, it, the Bible in your lap is like the jar of manna. Now, here's something you may not have known. When God gave the manna and he told Moses to take this manna and put it in a jar, somebody was responsible in all of their goings and all of their journeys to carry that jar of manna before the ark was built. Before the Ark of the Covenant, before Aaron's rod that budded and the jar of manna and the, and the tablets went in the Ark, that someone was responsible to carry this jar of manna around. And so here's this guy carrying around this, this jar of manna, and you have people saying, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die in the wilderness. Oh, why did we leave Egypt? We should have, we're going to die. I just know we're going to die. You know, I sure miss the garlic. I miss the onions. I miss the leeks. And here's this guy toting around this jar that proves that God provides in the wilderness. Amen. And we got Christians who, who has one of these things here, the Holy Bible, the, the testimony of God. They wag it into church on Sunday. They wag it home. And the whole time they got their jar of manna, they go, how's God going to provide for me? How's God going to meet my needs? How, God, how is God going to take care of my marriage? How is God going to take care of my kids? How is God going to get these kids through school? How is God going to take care of my car insurance? And we have something greater than a jar of manna. Yeah. It's the testimony of God. Yeah. I know we're going to die. Hey, look at the manna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how God's going to do it. Read your Bible. Right? The stories in the Bible are the testimony of God. The stories in the Bible are the testimony of God. When this testimony comes to us and it is revealed to us, it becomes a law in our heart. Listen to me very carefully. From God's perspective, it is His testimony when we receive it, it becomes the law of faith in our heart. Amen. It's his testimony, but it becomes the law of faith in our heart because God takes that testimony and he writes it upon the tablet of our heart. Yes. 
Numbers chapter 1, please. Numbers, Numbers chapter 1. You get anything out of this? Amen. This is the doctrine of God. Not the only one, but it is one of his doctrines. You can always tell the difference between the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man. The doctrine of God will put faith in you. The doctrines of men will take faith out of you. Amen. The doctrines of God will draw you closer to him. It will stir your love and devotion for him. The doctrines of men just makes you want to do more duty. Just got to perform, got to perform, got to perform. Just got to be a good little Christian. Numbers chapter 1, verse 50, please. <laughs> but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony. Why is it the tabernacle of testimony? Because the testimony was put in there. Those, t those ten commandments was put in there. And over all the vessels thereof and over all... Excuse me, I lost my place. Let me start again. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. And they shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own standard throughout their host. But the Levites shall pitch round about their tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the ta tabernacle of the testimony." The Levites were given by God and he told them that they were pitch, to pitch around about the tabernacle of testimony and they were to keep charge of it. I'm going to throw in a freebie. Those called by God into the ministry are charged of the Lord to pitch around about this book. And we are to lay up our lives before the testimony of God. That is our charge. That is what is required of ministers of the gospel. We're not to spend our time doing other things. I'm not saying you can't relax and have some fun. But our lives are to be laid up before this testimony. And if we do so, the testimony of God will keep us. Because our charge is to keep it so that you will know the truth. The tables of testimony, the pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded were preserved together. Those three things were in the ark, right? Tables of the covenant, tables of testimony, the jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded were put into this box. So when we look at that, Let's pretend that we take the lid off the box and look in there. We pick up the jar of man and go, wow, look at that. It's perfectly preserved. We put it back down. We pick up, we pick up Aaron's rod that's budded. It's got the flour. It's got the almonds. Look at that. Nice. Put it back in there. Then we go to the tables of testimony. And we go, well, two out of three is not bad. This third one's not been preserved. It's not the words, it's the thoughts behind the words. We cannot believe in two and not believe in the third. Amen. The words have been preserved ensuring the right thoughts. The words have been preserved ensuring the right thoughts. So this teaching that, well, the words aren't inspired by God, it was just the thoughts, cannot be because this is the testimony of the Lord. 
Can you imagine somebody being on the witness stand? And so they're asked the question about the accident. And so the person's up there on the witness stand, and they, and they say this. They say, they're asked, did you see the accident? Yeah, I saw it. What did you see? Well, <clears throat> I saw a brown sedan run the guy over. Brown sedan? Yeah. Well, in, the, in your statement earlier, you said it was a red truck. Well, it doesn't really matter if it was a brown sedan or a red truck. The guy got ran over. It, what, what, you know, it's, it was just a vehicle. He's no longer considered a valid witness because he changed his testimony. Amen. Words are important in a court of law. Words are important in a testimony. Words are important. The right words are important to a wife. The right words are important to God because the right words preserved will give you the right thought and the right meaning behind it. What is the testimony of God? It is God revealing himself to man, letting man know, this is my heart. This is my thoughts. This is my motive. This is my intent. And what I have done for you is I have provided for you everything you'll ever need in Christ Jesus. Amen. And to try and change the testimony is to obscure the heart of God. As we close... Go with me on another journey. Go with me to Psalm 19, please. We're going to close with this. Psalm 19, 7. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. As you go there, please say this after me. All scripture is inspired by God. All right, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 119, please. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. I was thinking about this and thinking about all the testimonies in the Bible. And I'm still studying on covenant and blood and things like that. And I had a new thought the other day as I was thinking about this. I thought about David getting a sling and he's running toward Goliath and he's, he's you know, about ready. To, I wonder if this thought came to his mind. I have a covenant and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> right? That's a testimony of God. David killing Goliath is God's testimony to you and I. He's going to provide for us no matter what giant we're facing. Amen. Look at uh, look the same psalm, Psalm 119. Look at verse 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. That is our heritage, brothers and sisters, the testimonies of God. In the natural, you may have a family where they're all stinkers and drinkers. You know? They're all boozers and, and womanizers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you have nothing really to hold your head up about concerning your natural family. This is our heritage right here. Amen. This is our family photo album. We are the family of God. Amen. And these testimonies should be our heritage. Look at verse 152. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that, that, that thou hast founded them forever. How about that? The testimonies of God have been founded forever. Verse 167. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. 
Isaiah chapter 8, please. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Are you there? <clears throat> to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To the law, to the testimony. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. The doctrine of God is not just found in a few places. The doctrine of God is not just found in the Old Testament. It is in both the Old and New. John chapter 3, verse 33. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. When you receive the testimony of God, you are going to say, God is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Man, what a great verse. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul preached the testimony of God. My final statements to you is that which is written remains. That which is written remains. That's why God had it written down to begin with. <laughs> that which is written remains. There is an absolute inseparable connection between the blood of the covenant, old or new, and the words. Right? There is an absolute inseparable connection between the blood of the covenant, old or new, and the words. This eternal and inseparable connection between the blood of redemption and the words of our covenant have led us always to be guided by the Bible alone. Amen. This is our guide. We know that God sent his son Jesus and Jesus shed his blood not for thoughts but for words. Amen. We can never in our minds separate the blood of Jesus from the words of the covenant. And keeping them together gives us great faith, great confidence that we have the testimony of God. It is made sure and it has been perfectly preserved for us. It is our foundation for faith. It is the basis for our conduct in this life. Amen? Amen? Thank you so much for listening today and being a part of the voice of faith. We appreciate it. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.